Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books podcast. Today is a special panel discussion featuring the lifetime work of a true pioneer in his field, Stanislav Grof, who's joining us along with his wife, Brigitte Grof. Brigitte is a psychologist and licensed psychotherapist and has been working with holotropic states of consciousness for over 36 years. Our discussion centers around a book titled Psyche Unbound, Essays in Honor of Stanislav Grof, which was edited by our other two guests, Richard Tarnas and Sean Kelly. Richard Tarnas is the founding director of the Graduate Program in Philosophy, Cosmology and Consciousness at the California Institute of Integral Studies, where for the past three decades, he has taught courses in the history of ideas, depth psychology, archetypal studies, and the evolution of religion. He's also the author of The Passion of the Western Mind and Cosmos and Psyche. Sean Kelly is also a professor of philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He's the author and editor of a number of books, including Becoming Gaia and the Variety of Integral Ecologies. The book we're exploring today, Psyche Unbound, is an extraordinary compilation of 22 essays from renowned academics, scientists, and researchers that honor the path-breaking life work of Stanislav Grof on the occasion of his 90th birthday. Grof is the founder and chief theoretician of transpersonal psychology and the world's leading researcher in psychedelic assisted therapy, breathwork, and the exploration of non-ordinary states of consciousness. Over the past half century, Groff has conducted thousands of LSD-assisted psychotherapy sessions, developed unique frameworks for supporting and understanding mental health, and ultimately created a new expansive cartography of the mind that welcomes spiritual experience with openness, rigor, and reverence. Our good friend Irvin Laszlo says this about Groff. After Sigmund Freud, who introduced the unconscious, the libido, and guilt, and Carl Gustav Jung, who introduced the collective unconscious and the archetypes, we now have Stanislav Groff, who widens the horizons by bringing in the perinatal and the transpersonal dimensions of human experience. I encourage everyone to learn more about Stan and his huge body of work over more than 60 years. You can visit his website, which is stangroff.com. So everyone, please join me in a warm welcome for Stan and Brigitte Groff, for Richard Tarnas, and for Sean Kelly. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks, Ross. Glad to be here. Likewise. Thank you. Now, before we get into our our conversation, I know that Stan and Brigitte wanted to say a few words uh, to everyone about about Stan's uh, stroke that he had a number of years ago and and how that affects his his speech and everything. So I'll I'll, I'll pass over to the two of you. Hello, everybody. and say good morning, but it could be good night. And uh, it's, we have this, we have so many different sides. Time sides, zones. Uh, time zones. Time zones. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, 
Rick and Sean. This is such an amazing, amazing uh, book and a great gift. Uh, I know that it a note for, for many, many uh, years. Uh, um, but it's an amazing uh, collection from, from uh, all over the world. Uh, I was looking at it and I realized uh, that a holotropic breathwork and psychedelic theory uh, don't stay in uh, in uh, uh, psychology and psychiatry. It's really ex explore the whole universe, you know. Mm -hmm. So we have philosophy, we have we have uh, psychiatry, psychology, we have the uh, um, shamanism. Uh, <laughs> yeah, shamanism. Yeah. Shamanism. Uh, uh, things from from Hinduism, from Tantra, mm -hmm. you know, from mm -hmm. from astrology and so on. Yes. So you have created a really amazing, amazing uh, collection, and uh, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, now, what I wanted to say before we start that uh, about three years ago I had a stroke. Um, I don't have any um, um, paraplegia or. Paralysis. No, no paralysis. Um, uh, the main focus was on was on uh, my speech, mm -hmm. which of course is uh, <laughs> the worst thing that uh, for this for this evening. So uh, I hope that I will be more more watched and and hear, you know, <laughs> rather than uh, talk too much. And we have we have. Uh, Brigitte here, uh, that if, if I need to help something, she, she would help me. Yeah. I would help you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I always say, it's, um, Stan knows everything, but he doesn't know all the words. And I don't know everything, but I know most of the words. So we make a good team in the speech. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. You want to add something, sweetheart? They very much thank two of you, of course, you know. For Ross and Jacob Ross and for doing Jacob, this. Yeah. Yes, thank you, everybody. So everybody for being here together today. Hmm. And Thanks. both Rick and I were, were in four four years ago. We were we were already in Benin. So it's a really wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. nice place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much that that uh, you are bringing us today. The it's stand. actually uh we are for us it's evening we are in germany so we are nine hours later than you so you are in the morning <laughs> yes yes yeah and well, stan and i used to um go up to hollyhock and and give mm -hmm. workshops and uh seminars there and uh, on some of those occasions we would do something at banyan books uh, in in vancouver and it was always mm -hmm. a, a great to to see your bookstore flourishing and still is yes thanks so much and it's thanks to the wonderful work and support of of researchers and authors like you guys that we do so well so thank you mm -hmm. i thought it might be appropriate to open with a quote from the introduction of the book that was written by the two of you rick and sean uh and as a doorway into the you know there's so much material that we can get into and we only have an hour to cover it uh you wrote in the intro Perhaps one of the reasons that Groff's work in psychology has been so fertile is its essential tension that drove his own intellectual journey and brought forth his breakthroughs. The tension between a conservative tradition, in this case, psychoanalytic theory wedded to mainstream materialistic science, and the profoundly multidimensional and transpersonal phenomena that he encountered in his research and therapeutic practice. Groff held that tension of opposites and brought forth a profound revolutionary synthesis. So I'm wondering if just for our audience's benefit, can we talk a little bit about the environment that Stan found himself in early on and the challenges and the prejudices that he had to work with and through over the years? Uh, sure, I, I would be, uh, I'd love to uh, address that. Just the, the original um, phrase at, uh, at the beginning of that sentence, the essential tension uh, that that comes from Thomas Kuhn, who of course wrote the structure of scientific revolutions and kind of gave us the whole um, uh, 
vocabulary and understanding of paradigms as as shaping uh, our, our our worldview, shaping a scientific um, uh, sensibility, and and then a paradigm starts meeting lots of anomalies and and goes through stresses and tensions, and then some Promethean genius comes along and opens up uh, a new horizon of understanding that uh, al allows the new data as well as the old to be um, more intelligibly, uh, uh, a, a better framework, a new paradigm. And um, the crucial idea there with the essential tension, which is related to Stan's achievement as I see it, is that he was coming out of such a um, uh, classic uh, modern scientific perspective and in the psychiatric uh, context, uh, coming out of psychoanalysis, classical psychoanalysis, there were some basically, you know, materialistic, uh, mechanistic, and uh, kind of atheistic assumptions that ran through all the uh, perspectives that he that he was educated within, and then he has uh, he's doing the the work to begin with 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 LSD and um, and the uh, the whole a more pharmacological understanding of what was going on with LSD, namely it's it's a drug response. But then as he as he kept working with it with his patients and in his own experiences, it became very clear that the experiences were just exploding way beyond uh, what could be understood just pharmacologically, also couldn't be understood in terms of cl classic modern uh, mainstream scientific perspectives, nor could it be understood um, through uh, Freudian and psychoanalytic perspectives alone, although it did point towards the um, accuracy of many of Freud's insights, namely that, that there is something like a, an unconscious domain of the human psyche uh, behind, underneath, surrounding human consciousness that deeply shapes it. And then many of the ideas of Freud in terms of repression and, and uh, interjection and projection and, and things like that, and early childhood trauma, importance of sexuality, all those things were affirmed, but way, all this other um, domain, these other domains of experiences were coming in that involved spiritual and mystical experiences that involved um, being able to enter into other uh, cultures and other historical epochs, even enter into different forms of animal consciousness or tree, trees and plants and so forth. Um, past life experiences and so forth, it just could not possibly be fit into the old paradigm. And Kuhn's whole point about the importance of a, an essential tension is that if you have somebody come in with, with lots of new data, new ideas, and but they don't have a proper grounding in, in the existing um, framework in the, uh, in the tradition, they're, they're, it doesn't, their new ideas don't have enough uh, roots to take hold and, and their, their paradigm revolution becomes a kind of flash in the pan. But in Stan's case, he had so deeply grasped the, the uh, vocabulary, the understanding uh, and the insights of the, of the old paradigm of the, of the, of the tradition he was able to make very um, illuminating linkages between the old and the new, um, between, uh, for example, the symptoms of, of, of depression uh, or of phobias uh, or of sexual disorders, um, uh, different uh, neuroses and even psychotic syndromes, and was able to connect those to the uh, deeper domains of, of the human psyche that involved both the reliving of birth, the encounter with death, and that opened up into the whole death rebirth mystery and shamanic initiations of uh, involving um, uh, dying and being reborn 
uh, and opened up into a whole uh, radically expanded uh, worldview. And so he was able to make those linkages in, a, in such a clinically articulate and compelling way, and at the same time um, serve as a bridge to open up the uh, power of this much more expansive understanding of the human psyche, which he came to regard as being essentially uh, equivalent to the soul of the entire cosmos, that all that's in, inside every one of us. We're not just drops in the ocean. The whole ocean is, is in the drop, as, as Rumi would put it. And um, I, think, I think that kind of points to, to Stan's, um, some of Stan's achievement that I'm, I'm so uh, grateful for. Uh, Rick? Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes. Hi, Stan. Yeah, there was this question about uh, how, how other people respond to uh, my work. And I should mention at least what happened in Prague. And there is a, a Sisyphus uh, club, <laughs> it's very similar to Sagan. Um, it's an astronomer. And uh, they gave um, Sisyphus uh, uh, delusional uh, Boulder. Bob holders. Boulders. <laughs> and uh, I got one. Uh, I got the biggest <laughs> one. The biggest, right? No, the first one. Uh, and it was basically for uh, transpersonal psychology. <laughs> and the other one was for holotropic breathwork. <laughs> and uh, then uh, this was in the first uh, 200,000. 200, and two. Oh, in 2000. Sorry, 2000. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> then in 2007, um, President Havel in Czech Republic uh, gave me an award, uh, mm -hmm. which is quite quite a um, good one. And uh, the Sisyphus uh, people were so uh, um, pissed at it that they gave <laughs> me a, a special 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 uh, uh, folder, broad, which was which was uh, delusional. Di this was diamond. Diamond delusional diamond. folder. Arch, arch duology. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So this, uh, this was, there was really a fight, you know, between between uh, this um, materialistic people and. Uh, yeah, it's actually it's actually a good sign because that means that uh, Stan is really challenging the, the old paradigm. If the people get so upset about it, you know, it's a good Exa sign. Ex exactly, and actually, that was uh, something that Thomas Kuhn uh, and other uh, historians of science have, have pointed out: is that the the more uh, powerful a, a an emerging paradigm is the more it, it is seen as a threat to the old one, mm -hmm. then it will arouse resistance that can become quite mm -hmm. uh, vit vitriolic. And um, what I love about Stan is here, here we're we're describing all the um, you know in in praise praising terms his work, and he 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 remembers this um, <laughs> award for for. That, that is essentially trying to delegitimize it, uh, but it's it's a sign of a person with with confidence in what they have done that they have uh, take a certain amused pleasure in um, such a uh, such a an award. Well, it's actually yeah. if you see a photo of these people who are you know being the representatives of the serious worldview, they look totally funny because they they dress like Greeks with, with this kind of plant around their head and and uh, long togas and stuff. They look like from Carnival, mm -hmm. you know, aren't they? They look totally uh, weird. The one, the other one was more like ignorance than an attack, and this is that uh, this is more over. 50 years, I have to, uh, now for the first time I gave the four matrices and I created images, you know, for fetuses. And uh, I have been still showing this in, in uh, every workshops now mm -hmm. and, and conferences and so on. The same one, and this was in, in Amsterdam, you know, and today still, still uh, psychiatrists really don't believe that there is a birth. Uh, that you can yeah. relive birth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a, 
you know, waiting for a fair paradigm, but not very good for mm -hmm. for fifty years, over fifty years. Well, yeah. Well, it's it's a slow process to change um, such a powerfully rooted uh, worldview. <clears throat> Sean, did you want to add anything to to what I was saying in, in response to Ross's question? Well, as so often happens, you you captured uh, pretty much everything that had occurred to me to say. I'll, but I'll just uh, just in terms of the title of this volume, Psyche Unbound. Um, I mean, it 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 refers on the one hand to the infinite expanses of mind and consciousness and experience that mm -hmm. that your work, Stan, uh, helped uh, unveil. Um, but I think it also means it's unbound to to prejudices and dogmatisms, mm -hmm. um, and in terms of this essential tension that that you mentioned, uh, Ross, um, the psyche may be unbounded, unbound as you reveal, but it's not ungrounded, as Rick was saying. Mm -hmm. Your your work, mm -hmm. uh, what I always found is so so uh, compelling is that just at the same time that that you opened up so much you you uh, your work honored and illuminated uh, the most uh, human existential uh, ethically pertinent issues of our time you know birth mm -hmm. death suffering mm -hmm. um war aggression i mean your the the insights that uh, that your your work and your cartography of the psyche provided um you know i'm I, I can't think of any other that is able to hold that tension between the grounded uh, and the and the unbound in a way. So, yeah, and the and the title uh, that Sean actually was the one that that uh, who thought of it, uh, and it's a, a brilliant title. I think it it actually does call to evoke the um, Prometheus Unbound uh, from Shelley's great poem, and the and the and the mythos of of Prometheus, which I just, um, in passing, mentioned in terms of like the Promethean genius who brings the new paradigm, who 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 basically addresses the fact that there are many um, the, the the research is bringing forth s forms of data, forms of evidence that just cannot be um, in uh, coherently integrated into the the old way of looking at things and but then there's a kind of illumination and um i think for for you stan that illumination seems to have happened right there in the in the middle of the 60s between 65 and 67 when uh when both through your own experiences and those of of the many uh patients that you were working with uh, in in prague uh, you, you suddenly grasp the the nature of the of the perinatal matrices and the importance of the death rebirth experience, both in illuminating the uh, range of psychological conditions, syndromes, psychopathology, uh, and so forth, and yet linked it to um, you know to uh, the the mystical uh, traditions and the shamanic and transformational. Um, death rebirth uh, mysteries and and rituals i think that that was such a uh that was your kind of promethean um threshold and where you just were wrestling in the middle of a crisis between holding the old perspective and yet dealing with the new one a new vision opened up and if i could just follow up on something that's very important about what sean just said um unbound also in the sense of not being bound or constrained by a, a particular uh, dogmatic view of the psyche. And I have now been, you know, working with, with uh, you, Stan, for 40, almost 50 years and uh, seen you in many different uh, situations, uh, uh, clinically and, or in the, uh, uh, in, in dealing with uh, crisis, psychological crises that people were having or, or big transformational experiences that people were undergoing. And one of the most um, vivid characteristics of your uniqueness, I think, in, as, a, as a psychiatrist and as a, a theorist of the psyche is that 
you basically regard each person and, and their psychological process and their depths of psyche as having uh, their own kind of, uh, its own self-healing uh, capacity, but also its own, um, the explanation for what is going on will come from within that person. And so you honor exactly. their process more as a, as a midwife rather than somebody who's trying to control the process and tell them, oh, well, mm -hmm. tell you, tell this person, um, okay, well, you're working through your Oedipus complex or, or something like that. You just encourage it to take place uh, of its own accord uh, because you trust it. You trust the unconscious. I really but value you know, that. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a native English speaker, but could unbound also mean free in a mm. way? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because because I mean I I live with stands obviously and and we share life in in all you know aspects and uh, one wonderful thing about him be, besides many many is that he's a super free spirit and uh, and that that willingness to to have that beginner's mind again and again and again and to find out different things that even challenge his. His paradigm uh, is is as fresh as ever, even with ninety. And we've just had uh, basically more recently. I did uh, this interview with you, yeah, for mm -hmm. uh, where I asked you. So, what, where, where are you now after sixty years of working with LSD and uh, holotropic states of consciousness? What has changed over the time? And so, even. Even even recently, there has been a major change again, uh, saying that from the discovering from the pharmacology, the, the perinatal and the transpersonal, and then and then eventually even really coming to the archetypal principle. That's even more behind. I mean, Rick, Rick, of course, uh, you you and Stan have worked that out very well together, and uh, so 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 this is an, an example how how you always, you continue and you actually say that your life has been like the Newton uh, treasure hunt, right? Treasure hunt, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Newton treasure hunt. So so this is the willingness to always find the next clue that that leads to the next insight, you know, and this is, is still there and we're still open for new, for new treasures, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, uh, you didn't get stuck with one uh, in one, breakthrough and then that becomes a dogma you you're you're constantly mm -hmm. um letting the, the the new uh evidence and the new insights um work uh, of their own accord and and you trust those process that mm -hmm. process as well beyond any particular formulation that you might make at a, at a given time well ross we should have you in this you know oh go ahead Stan. Yeah, the uranus uranus pluto you know and saturn it happened many times in me that I you know, get some experience that just blow, blow my mind, you know, and then I try to put it together into some kind of a new uh, uh, mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. and until, until something happens. So many times it happens to mm -hmm. me, you know, it's yeah. blowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And also the, the other personality trait that's really strong is this um, unbound curiosity. And that's also... Uh, a, a drive to really find out more and more and be so curious you know this is also as fresh as ever right you're still as curious as ever oh. i think that um for our audience's benefit we've touched a number of times now so far on the four um basic perinatal matrices i'm wondering if we can just sort of give an overview of that discovery by Stan through the LSD uh, therapy and and uh, what that sort of uncovered and 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 showed about um, the depths of the human psyche. Yeah. Sean, do you want to? No, I mean I certainly could, but you you have you have um, much more uh, experience, and uh, so please please go ahead. Yeah. Well. Um... Right, though I've seen you've you've written very very wisely and perceptively about it, Sean. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I could just say, um, as as people's experiences deepened in the original uh, what Stan was using with lower to medium dose uh, LSD sessions in the '60s in a 
serial form, often only every 11 days. Uh, this was a called the psycholytic uh, method. And one of the advantages of it is that it, it served as a kind of gradual, I think, uh, Stan, you've called it like onion peeling, or I think one of your patients uh, called it like onion mm -hmm. peeling, where you're, you keep mm -hmm. getting to deeper and deeper levels. And as um, uh, people would get a deeper grasp of what was going on in, in, their, in their psychological life as a result of earlier and earlier experiences that were shaping their, their uh, worldview, shaping and, and affecting their um, and perhaps creating neurotic symptoms or, or syndromes of one kind or another, but they would move from later, say, uh, experiences in a lifetime to earlier and earlier childhood, to infancy, to nursing experiences. But then to the surprise of, of Stan and the psychoanalysts, it moved beyond those early infantile experiences, which were for Freud the earliest that you could have, and opened up into um, ex a reliving of, of physical, of biological birth, but in the most mysterious way, interconnected with an encounter with with death, uh, with and the whole process of dying, the whole process of not only physical, you know, biological uh, dying, but also like existential, um, spiritual, uh, dark night of the soul, uh, deep feelings of of um, hopelessness or of uh, uh, even um, like the, the end of the world or uh, so it was kind of like a, a both spiritual as well as biological and then these could also get interconnected with collective experiences of involving um, identification with people who are like prisoners or who are uh, caught in or who are um, uh, in an oppressive society, uh, enslaved and so forth. And then this, when as people kept moving through these experiences, they eventually in integrating them seem to, uh, in the very act of experiencing dying, they were experiencing being born and they're like dying out of the old womb, dying out of the amniotic condition of the uh, fetus in, in the, um, inside the mother and being, uh, as that universe collapse, a whole nother one opens up that would not have been possible without the uh, grievous dying and losing of, of the old, of the old life. And um, that experience, which is so, parallel to many mystics and um, uh, initiated individuals experiences uh, from their own uh, powerful rituals uh, and um, spontaneous spiritual emergencies and breakthroughs and so forth. Uh, that, that um, Stan was able to see that there were four particular matrices or um, kind of within the, the phenomenology of people's experiences, like what it was like to have these experiences, he saw a kind of clustering or package of, of these four different um, matrices that connected both to the birth process, such as being at one with the mother in the womb, in a, uh, in a good womb experience, everything is, all nourishment is taken care of, uh, kind of unitive, uh, blissful state, and that this connected to experiences of paradise, of, of, of Eden, of being at, at one with all of nature, being at one with uh, uh, divinity, and then if that would be followed by the beginnings of the birth process, a collapse, a uh, loss of that, that beautiful, you know, paradise loss, and an entry into what could feel like a uh, complete um, hell. Uh, a no exit situation, a feeling of uh, being trapped in a world of, of suffering that was entirely meaningless. Um, and then this opened up to an experience of tremendous volcanic energies, uh, hyper uh, ag aggressive, instinctual, elemental energies, volcanic, uh, that uh, in a kind of explosive, destructive way, actually opened up into an experience of, of rebirth. 
And this seemed to connect to the stages of biological birth in terms of the initiation of the birth process. The cervix is closed. There's no way out. One's trapped in the birth canal. Uh, the uterine contractions are happening. No oxygen's available uh, because the umbilical cord's contracted. And then uh, the, the cervix uh, begins to open. The, the, the maternal uh, organism, the mother's body, and the infant are working now kind of both together and in uh, antithesis with each other to bring about painfully but um, miraculously the, this birth of a, new, of a new being. And then that's the rebirth, paradise regained, the reconnection with the with the, the great mother goddess, with, with um, reuniting with, with nature and, and, and the, the feeling of a sacred event having happened and, and the sense of being unbound, of being born into a, a vast new universe that one had no idea uh, existed. So that's basically, uh, and, that, and that opens up from then on to people's experiences of, of mystical transpersonal states of all kinds. See, I told you that's why. That's why I wanted to... <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know what, Sean? I, maybe I can ask you because in your essay, "Seekers of a Second Birth," you highlight the work of William James and the varieties of religious experience. You use it along with Stan's transpersonal theoretical constructs, and you explore. And I'm quoting you. You call it a key issue in transpersonal theory, namely the relationship between the perinatal and the transpersonal. So I'm wondering maybe if you can highlight and help us explore that that relationship between the perinatal and the transpersonal. Sure. Well, as, as Rick just described, uh, what was so remarkable uh, in Stan's findings from the beginning is that the, the physical, biological, and personal, and the spiritual transpersonal often were either co-present or alternating or overlapping uh, in the same in the same experiences in a kind of holographic manner. Um, so, uh, you know, if you, if one is situated in a, in a in a more reductive materialistic paradigm, uh, there there would be the tendency to reduce transpersonal spiritual experiences of rebirth of of um, uh, you know shamanic initiation and so on to nothing but a replaying of biological birth that would be that would be one kind of reduction that would be common that we might see in in freud you know freudian psychoanalysis for instance um, on the other hand uh, it's also conceivable that some people might mistake what they consider to be a purely spiritual transpersonal experience or sorry that they might uh, they might consider that all that they're having is a purely spiritual transpersonal experience when in fact they they may also be dealing with unprocessed traumatic residues from their own physical incarnation that they've carried from birth so again this is that essential tension that stan's model is is so beautifully able to to accommodate uh where you know initially uh uh the basic perinatal matrices, uh, Stan called them the, the Ronkian unconscious after Otto Ronk, um, you know, uh, a, uh, who, was who was excluded by Freud as a heretic because he, he recognized the importance of biological birth. Um, so this was a, an amazing discovery to begin with. But fairly soon after, you know, as, as I said, Stan realized that, that the basic patterns are... are can't be reduced to birth. It's simply that as we come into the world, this is our first initiation into the separate self sense. It's the first experience of the deep pattern of initiation, which um, you know Joseph Campbell, for instance, who who uh, 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 whose chapter opens our our book, uh, recognized as the same deep pattern behind the most widely spread mythological motif the voyage of the hero the hero's journey so that that the same pattern behind the hero's journey or the monomyth as joseph campbell called it uh is revealed by these basic perinatal matrices so 
you know, in, in uh, later years, uh, as, as an example of Stan's uh, openness to the evidence and continuing um, refinement of uh, his theory, um, explicitly moved away or warned against reducing the basic perinatal matrices to nothing but biological birth, but saw these, these patterns as, as a manifestation of a more, of a higher dimensional archetypal reality, uh, which uh, we could call the death rebirth archetype. So, um, you know, so we, ha we already have an idea with Jung and, and Campbell and others of the death rebirth archetype, but what the perinatal matrices give us is a much more detailed phenomenology of that archetype that we see at work, yes, in biological birth, but we see it at work in shamanic initiation, in the voyage of the hero, we see it at work in widespread cultural uh, um, phenomena. We see it at work, as Stan uh, pointed out in, in the conclusion of Beyond the Brain and elsewhere, whenever we have war and mass, uh, mass movements uh, that, uh, that, that uh, involve aggression and so on. So the, the theory is, is, is rich and, and complex. Um, and, uh, yeah, once you once you rock it, once you get it, it's amazing. You see it everywhere because it is. It's a fundamental archetype that uh, uh, structures so much of our human experience. That's brilliant, Sean. Um, yeah, I like uh, that that sense of once you get it, that it it starts illuminating much more than than one could one even realized might be coherently connected in in a larger uh, frame of reference. Um, I remember uh robert schwartz who used to uh he, he ran tarrytown center many years ago and uh was somebody who highly regarded stan's work and he i remember him saying to me once at one of the international transpersonal conferences he said uh stan stan has answers to questions we're not even smart enough to ask um and, uh, <laughs> there's, there's something something to that i you're bringing up Joe Campbell, Joseph Campbell, Sean, I th is uh, a helpful reminder that what we're talking about here is, is a book that is, um, has about 20 contributions from quite extraordinary scholars and authors. Um, and it begins with, after our introduction, um, with a kind of biographical overview of Stan's life, we also then, uh, Joseph Campbell does the first uh, uh, essay, which was the first written of of the because it was it was written in 1970 71 um over 50 years ago and i've i've read the letters where he in fact we included a couple of the letters in the book where he writes about his first encounter with stan's um he writes a letter to stan when the books when stan's work is still only in manuscript form and he is talking about <laughs> how blown his mind is. He said, this, this has become my, my principal book, um, capital P, capital B, I think it's something like that. Um, the, the most, or the most important one that for his research, because it just gave his own research on world mythologies, a coherent uh, uh, framework to, to understand it. And then Houston Smith writes the next one, uh, the great um, historian of religion, uh, philosopher of religion and uh, his his deep sense of uh, the significance of Stan's work, and then there's Fritjof Capra making the connections with with uh, modern physics. There's Frances Vaughan and uh, her her experiences. Jenny Wade's great uh, connections of Stan's work with her work in uh, people's transpersonal and mystical sexual experiences. How sexual experiences can uh, open up to um, to uh, mystical and transpersonal spiritual dimensions, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, many other uh, Paul Paul Groff Stan's brother has uh, a, an essay um, on the the use of holotropic breathwork um, in working with depression. Um, Will Keepen has a brilliant essay on the. Uh, how powerful holotropic breathwork and Groff or, or uh, Groff breathwork, as it's called now, um, how much that is 
has played a role in the healing of gender relations in the, the work that uh, Will and, and his wife, Cynthia Bricks, have done all around the world, and even played a crucial role in the political life uh, of, of uh, South Africa, um, and probably played a role in saving quite a few people's lives. Just, you, you'll have to read the story to see how it worked out, where um, uh, it, it had a powerful effect on people who were in positions of power and could transform the, the ways in which uh, the nation was dealing with the AIDS crisis. And um, it was very, anyway, there's, there's quite a few remarkable essays. I've only mentioned about a half, a, a half dozen, but there's about 20 essays in there, all of which are quite illuminating and, and uh, extraordinary. They really are fantastic. You know, I want to encourage everyone to, to go out and get this book. My feeling reading it is that you guys could have, I mean, it could have been double or triple the size easily. What was the process like for you, Rick and Sean, in, in putting this book together and, and uh, you know, uh, assembling all of these essays from all of these wonderful uh, people who've been influenced by STEM? Well, collecting them um, was, was uh, fairly easy in the sense that they were, people were writing these anyway. And um, I think the, the Joseph Campbell one was originally a lecture that he gave in, uh, in New York City. Uh, Houston Smith uh, did his in a, in a, it was a chapter in one of his books. And, and then he, he was very enthusiastic about it going into the, into the special trip. I started collecting these, you know, close to 30 years ago. And, uh, and then we had many of the essays up uh, together by about 20 years ago. Uh, but life is so busy and I, there's so many things were on the, uh, my, my desk uh, that I didn't have, I, I wasn't able to complete the process of, of putting these all together into a fest drift, or, which is a anthology in honor of, uh, of a senior scholar uh, uh, that we all admire. And then um, what happened was that Sean um, joined me. I asked uh, if Sean would, would uh, join me to help co-edit it. And, and that made a huge difference. And one big advantage in waiting the, uh, these years or it, it getting delayed to this, this number of years is that we are able to bring in uh, contributions from people who are working within the current psychedelic renaissance, the, the major researchers such as um, uh, Charlie Grobe and um, uh, Michael Mithoffer, um, who are right at doing the kind of cutting edge, uh, their newly legalized uh, psychedelic therapy that has been embraced now by the psychiatric and medical profession in a way that was not, um, we weren't quite sure when that was going to happen, even though 50 years ago, we knew this was the future, but we didn't know how long that future would be suppressed by basically kind of social, political, and um, even medical uh, ignorance. And now it, it, uh, it's taking off. And so as a result, we were able to include essays uh, by these uh, contemporary um, psychedelic researchers that were written uh, literally in, in the last uh, 15 months and really show um, how much Stan's work played a role in making possible this current renaissance. And it, in some ways you could see Stan's work is the bridge from the earlier renaissance of the, or well, within the Western modern context, uh, Western non indigenous societies, the, the psychedelic awakening that happened because psychedelics were already part of so many indigenous cultures. So it was more like modernity that was taking the, uh, that was getting the awakening. And so Stan is kind of the bridge between that first awakening that happened in the fifties and sixties, uh, and the, um, current renaissance that is just uh, unfolding in our in our own time and I, I think many of us regard and Rick Doblin who's the head of MAPS is one person uh, who makes this point in his forward to the book 
um, head of, he's the head of the multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies that has funded so much of the research uh, and that allowed for this legalization to take place. And his point as the one, like the one I'm making right now is how much Stan's work is, was made possible what's happening now and formed a kind of foundation and a bridge between the, um, the earlier one, a half century ago, and the current one. Thanks, Rick. Did you have any comments, Sean, on on the experience of putting the book together? And you know, was it was it difficult to to pare it down to these essays, or were there more that you would have liked to include? Well, um, I mean, it would be nice to have a second volume at some point. Uh, that's for sure. But uh, uh, no, the the uh, all I can say is it's just. Um, such an honor for me, you know, to uh, have been able to do this, to have uh, my name alongside Stan and Rick and all of these uh, other uh, people who have done such fine work. Um, I just feel so blessed. You know, I, I don't know yet how it happened, but I'm, I'm grateful that it did. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have some audience questions here, and just given our time, we maybe we can get to one or two of them, if that's all right with all of you. Yeah, please, please, please do. I'll just add to what Sean just said. The the reason that you you found yourself in that position, Sean, is that you were uniquely uh, capable of 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 giving the, this um, doing this uh, achievement and the services so so brilliantly. Hmm. There's a question here from Matthew who says, Jung seemed to use dreams as diagnostic tool to heal the psyche. What are the similarities and differences between dreams and psychedelic experiences to this end? Is it the same but more intense, a different type of diagnostic approach altogether, or something else? Very good question. You want to take a run at it, Sean, or do you want me to start? Or you want to say something, Stan? Do you like to say something? Well, I mean, one, sorry. Yeah. Well, we could start and then, then Stan could chime in if. Yeah. If, if, so, yeah, I think there's a bridge. There's a bridge, bridge between uh, Freud's uh, dream uh, work and, and uh, uh, Jung. You know, Jung uh, uh, wanted to, to see. Uh, the dream as it is emerging, whereas uh, Freud sometimes said uh, dreams, you know, that throughout many, many years, there's a story when he was in the, in the uh, drain, a train, and there is a um, passenger with him and, and remember the dream 20 years ago, and, uh, you know, Freud sit down and, and uh, interpret it. Now, uh, Jung wanted when, when the, um, science with these uh, patients would come he wanted them to lie down on the on the couch mm -hmm. and let the let the dream to continue mm -hmm. and he believed that you know with this situation actually uh, you get in touch with the with the um, material from the unconscious that is in very powerful but it's also very close to the to uh, the um, surface. Sur surface, you know, um, and so this is then very close to what we are doing with allotropic breathwork and with psychedelics, when uh, you you give uh, the experiences mm -hmm. that uh, what what starts coming is the something from the unconscious which is very strong. Mm -hmm. um, and also close available available actually that day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there are many others which are very important uh, very powerful but they might be several several times in the sessions mm -hmm. before it's ready mm -hmm. so there's this Jung between uh, there's a relationship a bridge between Jung and uh, uh, Freud, uh, Freud and Jung and uh, the work with psychedelics and, and holotropic breathwork but still, there would be, a, I mean, a psychedelic experience would be different from a dream. Yeah. Wouldn't it? I mean, 
a psychedelic experience would be different from a dream. Well, there could be. There's a there's a connection between the uh, unconscious uh, in the in the dreams mm -hmm. and in mm -hmm. psychedelics and also in holotropic breathwork. Yes. Yes. So many people actually have have experiences in uh, in holotropic session that continue something that happened in the, in the dream, mm -hmm. and the other one something that's unfinished mm -hmm. can then come into the next holotropic breathwork. Yeah at night or, or mm -hmm. in, from psychedelics at, during night so there's a continued mm -hmm. yeah there's a con there's a continuity between um the yeah. dream life and the and the psychedelic ses sessions mm -hmm. um but psychedelic sessions um journeys tend to be uh except in rare d cases of dreams psychedelic experiences tend to be more intense um and but there's also a a waking quality to the um to the psychedelic session um mm -hmm. that uh, and and a an embodied somatic dimension mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. the healing can take mm -hmm. place so uh mm -hmm. when there's a catharsis when there's a release yeah. of pent-up right. um uh, energies mm -hmm. in in the in the not only in the in the mm -hmm. soul but in the body which are basically yes. united um there is a possibility for a therapeutic uh, healing that um, mm -hmm. takes on a different, somewhat different quality than uh, what what typically happens in dreams. So some dreams can be mm -hmm. very healing indeed. Mm -hmm. Jung, in a sense, was kind of providing a bit of a link there through active imagination, where uh, he was, as Stan was saying, you're he would have people continue the dream, but do it in in this um, conscious state, uh, and that was very much mm -hmm. in the present. And then there could be also more of the somatic uh, uh, transformational dimension at work as well. Mm -hmm. Sean, you were going to say something. Oh, <clears throat> uh, well, one other aspect I think is like uh, Jung characterized the dream as a sort of snapshot. Or a picture of the psyche of the of the of the state or the condition of the psyche as a whole in that moment and similarly at least with lsd stan you know was the first to to describe the effect of lsd at least as a non-specific amplifier of the psychic process mm -hmm. so uh, in in a sense the the psychedelic state is is like an amplified dream you might say uh in in Jung's sense it's 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 revealing the psyche mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that moment where the tensions are and so on. Of course, that can open up into all kinds of other dimensions. But I think yeah, a, a big difference mm -hmm. is that um, in dreaming, the body is normally more or less paralyzed, whereas in, in, in psychedelic work, the, uh, the body is, is fully awake <laughs> and engaged in that sense. So it, it offers mm -hmm. different, different potentials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, the the last thing was that oh yeah, yeah. so so Jung Jung saw the dream often as compensatory to the mm -hmm. conscious position. So it, it it was a snapshot of the wider field of the psyche that offered the possibility of compensating the position of of the conscious ego and hopefully moving it in the direction mm -hmm. of wholeness or individuation, as Jung called. Similarly, Stan, uh, you know, uh, uh, has a very similar view of uh, the unconscious or the deeper psyche and holotropic states um, offering what might be useful in that moment mm -hmm. at that uh, in the person's life to move them in the direction of wholeness and, and this is one of the mm -hmm. the uh, great beauty and um, richness of stan's understanding of holotropic states of consciousness but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah the sure, there's also like a, a there's intelligence in the psyche. We, we try to work with that. You know, uh, psychiatrists or psychologists have different sort of uh, concepts, you know, mm -hmm. how, how they should work with, uh, with uh, patients. There is much better, much easier just to use this kind of um, mm -hmm. uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. So for example, when what Jung was talking, what I was talking about, when uh, there is something powerful, uh, from the unconscious that's close to the to the um, surface. Uh, surface and we can help it to to bring it up this is also at the same time uh, the the sim symptom mm -hmm. this is something that's the most problem for the for the mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. 
This is the opposite of what psychiatrists are doing, is to suppress the symptoms, mm -hmm. whereas you want to help somehow uh, because there's already an intelligence mm -hmm. of the of the psyche to, to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. To amplify, let the symptom amplify and express itself to what's what's behind it. Yeah. 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 That's yeah, also a difference. To go the, go to, ahead, to it's like homeopathy. Homeopathy. Homeopathy, you know, mm -hmm. but when you actually in, intensify, intensify some the, the problem rather than try to suppress it. Yeah. Yeah. The number of times I've seen Stan in a, in a situation where somebody's going through, you know, quite an unpleasant or uh, difficult um, state emotionally, physically, uh, and um, Stan will. Uh, say that's great go, go with it you know um amplify the sound or or uh if if they need um if they're struggling with some particular um somatic symptom then it can be very helpful at certain 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 time, certain time times to, to increase like the pressure on their shoulder or something like that to help them um uh release the energy but basically there's a trusting of the process that the symptom is actually uh, a signal from the unconscious of something that needs to happen and isn't something that you want to just uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> erase by by using some other kind of <clears throat> medication that eliminates your awareness mm -hmm. of what's trying to happen. Yeah, I think, uh, Rick, what you're mentioning is also a basic difference to a dream. I mean, there's sometimes people scream in a dream or something like that, but but in the holotropic work, in the breath work or in the psychedelic work, you actually work with these symptoms or energies that want to express themselves in a conscious way. It comes from the unconscious, but then then you cooperate with it and you express it. And so so this way, the person would integrate that in a different way than in the in the dream. It's a bit much more physical or much more conscious and and tangible in, in a way, which is not compared to a sleep state. So, so so even when they're related, the the way they would perform would be different. Thank you. I think that given our time, we probably don't have time for more audience questions. We're already a few minutes after the hour here. I just want to remind our audience that we've been speaking about this new book, Psyche Unbound, Essays in Honor of Stanislav Grof. And we've been in conversation with the editors of the book, Rick Tarnas and Sean Kelly, and of course, Stanislav Grof and his wife, Brigitte Grof. And uh, I just want to thank our audience so much for being here for the live event. And of course, you can find most of the recordings of these episodes on our podcast on YouTube. Just search for Banyan Books, or you can look on any podcasting platform as well. Just search for Banyan Books, um, and uh, you can find the audio on those platforms. Now, before we close, I, I just wanted to uh, ask about the the Groff legacy training that I know Brigitta and, and Stan have founded and, and the future of Stan's work as it goes forward in, into the next generations. Okay, so too much the work with uh, Brigitte or that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we have, uh, you know, we, we have created this new training to, to, you know, spread Stan's work and also the holotopic breathwork he has created with his late wife, Christina. Uh, Groff and uh, we call as uh, Rick also mentioned we call it Groff breathwork now for several reasons and the uh, Groff breathwork is the form of holotropic breathwork that really represents what uh, you know Stan wants to see the work updated, and, updated. and it's also um, the, the training also has a, a good theoretical background because uh, Stan another big book that Stan has made is uh, The Way of the Psychonaut this is his life's work encyclopedia in two volumes and uh, also um, the shift network he has recorded uh, Teleseminars, uh, the way of the psychonaut, and also with with Rick together, uh, the psyche and cosmos, and that was before the stroke. So luckily, all Stan's teaching is conserved in beautiful ways. And uh, so, in in our new training, this is going to be in the different countries of the world, and we are just sort of created this umbrella, and the the people, the teachers 
teach their own trainings in their countries under our supervision and yes. guidance. Teach it from all over the world. Yeah. Yes, and uh, so you can find that it's also, it's a training on working with holotropic states of consciousness. So it includes the, the holotropic breathwork, the, um, the working with breathwork, with uh, growth breathwork, and uh, uh, also uh, learning to be sitters for psychedelic sessions. And uh, spiritual emergency. Okay. Also dealing with spiritual emergencies or sitting with dying people, because it's all basically the same process. And so, uh, and we have, you know, uh, wonderful guest teachers, and uh, it's really a great, great program. So anybody who's interested, you can find on our website, growth legacy training graph slash legacy slash training dot com you can find you know in in your country uh the, the people who run the training and uh, connect with them for more information wonderful <laughs> thank you ross i i I'm, I'm noticing that the um the for the first time I, I saw that there were these um qu questions on a on on the t in the q a uh to the side and it looks like we we kind of covered a number of them, but I was just going to say the answer, one of the questions, what was the name of the 1970-71 book that I re, that I mentioned? That was Joseph Campbell's uh, Myths to Live By. Uh, that was the, the book, uh, and uh, of course, Psyche Unbound is the, is the book that um, uh, we're, we're discussing here that Joseph's, uh, Joseph Campbell's essay appears in. Um, and then, Stan, you'll want to see the, um, the very nice comment from an, an indigenous uh, shaman who uh, has something there for a, a message to you of uh, right. their respect for you. He's going to read. It's from, Ross it's is from read Sylvia. It. Sylvia says, I'm an indigenous mm -hmm. shaman, Nisca tribe from BC. I'm honored to be here with you, Stan. Your contributions to transpersonal personal realms have helped uplift indigenous shamanic work into modern realms. I have lived out visions come true since age six and have helped others explore and heal. Thank you, Stan. Thank you very much. That's, Thank you. There's a really great connection, you know, between mm. between things happening in shamanism mm. and, and things mm. what people in the indigenous people were yes. working, you know, we we're borrowing really a lot of it, a lot. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody, for your questions. And, you know, given our time, it's unfortunate we couldn't get to more of them. Um, but it's so great to have everybody here joining us live. And, of course, mm -hmm. a big thanks to our producer and events curator, Jacob Steele, for everything that he does. Um, thank you. A, thank you very and much. A big, yeah. And a big thank you to all of you. It's really such an honor uh, to be a part of this with, with all of you, Stan, Brigitte, uh, Rick, and Sean. Um, a big thank you from myself and everyone at Banyan Books. Thank you, Russ. Thanks very much. And thank you, Jacob, for uh, behind the scenes hosting of us there. Yeah. Jake and Sean, I just thank you so much for, for everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. This is this is just the last thing, you know, mm. is happening for, for years. Thank you so much. Mm. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. And I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com. <laughs>